How are hazardous drugs defined? So we don't have to list them today because NIOSH has already done that for us. NIOSH listed these common hazardous drugs starting back in 2016 and then added to those in 2018. They now have 239 drugs on that list and they've grouped them into tables based on their toxicological endpoint. Example, group one are anti-neoplastics or chemotherapy type drugs. And then group two and three have other types of hazards. Now, NIOSH sat on that for a while, but then they came out with a new list in 2020, and that's still in draft form going through the comment period. They took some drugs off, they added some drugs, and they regrouped them into essentially two tables, one for anti-neoplastics, two for everything else, and their, their different types of, of hazardous impacts uh, through occupational exposure. Now, that's what the list comes from NIOSH, but really your facility should create this list based on the NIOSH list. And you really should use um, a hierarchy of controls and a assessment of risk to determine how are you going to best handle those hazardous drugs to reduce the risk of occupational exposure. Also new from the chapter, it specifically addresses eyeglasses you know, there have been studies done that show people how many, how often people touch their eyeglasses throughout the day, either just sort of adjusting them on the bridge of the nose or, you know, pulling them off. So it's really important that you develop a procedure and, and define it in your SOP for having folks a procedure to disinfect those eyeglasses. As a best practice, contact recommends you only use disinfectant on the frames. <clears throat> Sometimes disinfectants or sterile alcohol could mess up the coatings on the lenses. So just use a lens cleaning wipe to clean the eyeglass lens itself, but you want to use a true disinfectant dis to disinfect the frames before you go and begin your garbing process. Now, another class of compounds that are not on the NIOSH list is beta-lactam antibiotics. And here's an example, a common example of penicillin. So this particular uh, class of drugs is, is not on the list, but it does have a potential for harm from exposure. Perhaps five to 15% of the American public are allergic to beta-lactam antibiotics, and some of those reactions can be quite severe. So Patricia asked me, what garb must be sterile versus non-sterile? That's a great question. What we talk about today is category one and category two compounding. So category one is mostly going to be done in an SCA. So for category one or two, you could do that in a clean room. When you move into category three compounding, I didn't want to sort of muddy the waters in today's webinar because it's a wholly different uh, department. So when you get into category three compounding, all of your garb must be sterile. So from head to toe, all the garb you're wearing has got to be sterile. You can't have any exposed skin, so you'd have to wear, you know, full head coverings like this versus a bouffant. You know, when you move into category three, it really is sort of a significant difference. So that's really where sterile garb comes into play. For category one and category two, two compounding, only your gloves must be sterile. So sterile gloves always, one, two, or three, and then category three is just going to be sterile, all garb. Everything's going to have to be sterile for category three.
Welcome to our webinar presented live by Contact Healthcare from Studio 289 at our headquarters in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Hello, I'm Michael Myers coming to you from just outside of 289. Welcome to our latest webinar. Today we're going to be talking about material handling, primarily where the revised chapter 797 talks about moving materials into our clean room suite and moving materials into our primary engineering control. But I wanted to start just outside of our studio here today in our loading dock, in our warehouse, because that's where every box is gonna arrive at a facility. It's gonna arrive way downstairs, away from the pharmacy, and you really wanna leave that cardboard there. You don't wanna transfer cardboard up to your pharmacy. So as a best practice, you're gonna to wanna to transfer the product out of the cardboard into a tote, plastic tote like this that you could move up to the pharmacy. Later in our webinar today, Context Chief Microbiologist, Dr. Mark Weinsick, will be talking specifically about sort of the dangers of corrugated cardboard and some of the, the gross things that could hop along during that shipment and uh, unfortunately could arrive in your pharmacy. So we're gonna transfer the product out of this cardboard box. I'm gonna place it inside of our plastic tote. And then we're gonna go in the studio into our clean room and we'll talk about transferring materials into and out of uh, our engineering controls. So let's go to the pharmacy. All right. So we've got our materials up. We're in our general area and the pharmacy outside of the clean room. And let's talk specifically about what the chapter says about moving materials into a clean room. If you look at section eight in the chapter, section 8.1 says before any item is introduced into the clean side of the anteroom, placed into a pass-through chamber or brought into your segregated compounding area, Providing that the packaging integrity is not going to be compromised, that product must be wiped with a sporicidal disinfectant, an EPA-registered disinfectant, or sterile 70% IPA using wipes by personnel wearing gloves. So one of the things you saw in that chapter, it talked about a pass-through. Now, a lot of clean rooms aren't going to have a pass-through built, but if you do have a facility with a pass-through that runs from your general pharmacy area out to your buffer room, you're simply gonna take the product and you're gonna wipe it down as you place it into that pass-through chamber. And then the people on the other side of that pass-through chamber are gonna be able to quickly grab that product from the inside of that clean room and introduce it in. So that is one of the ways that you can introduce a product into the clean room, but you're still gonna be required to wipe that product with either an EPA registered disinfectant, a sporicidal disinfectant, or sterile 70% IPA. Contact believes is a best practice that you're gonna use a sporicidal disinfectant. And the chapter also requires that the person wiping the product down be wearing gloves. I, today I'm gonna to be using Contact's product, which is Paradox, our sporicidal disinfectant. And I'm made up using our Sanitex container, some pre-saturated Paradox wipes. So you're gonna take that bottle of product that you left at the loading dock, you loaded it into a plastic tote to bring it up to your clean room and you either wiped it down to place it into your pass-through chamber or you're gonna wipe this product down. Make sure you're getting it wet enough that you're gonna achieve that three minute dwell time that's required by the Paradox and that you're really sort of wiping every, every nook and cranny of that plastic bag that it arrived in. You know, the product is double bag, but we're really right now, we're going to be focusing on wiping the outside of that packaging. And I'm going to take this product. I've got, we're in my anteroom here. I'm on the dirty side of my line of demarcation. I've got a staging cart that's placed on the clean side of my line of demarcation. I've got it sort of away from the sink. 
so we won't have any splashing. And once this product is wiped down, I'm going to take it and just place it across that clean side of the line of demarcation so that it's now on the clean side of my room. And then I then will be able to take that in towards my buffer room for use in the primary engineering control. Since I use Paradox, our sporicidal disinfectant, over here by my trash can, I have a resealable um, sort of Ziploc style bag. So I'm going to be placing those used wipes in that bag just to help control some of that sporicidal odor. You know, the chapter did say that you could use sterile alcohol, you could use an EPA registered disinfectant, or you could use a sporicidal disinfectant. Earlier when I was standing out on the loading dock, I talked about some of the dangers that can come with corrugated cardboard. Our chief microbiologist, Dr. Mike Reinsick, was not able to be here in the studio with us today, but we grabbed him last week to pre-record some important thoughts uh, about the dangers of corrugated cardboard and the stuff that might come along for the ride into your clean room. Hi, I'm Mark Weinsek, a principal microbiologist here at Contact Healthcare. We're talking about material transfer today, and that process starts in our stock room. And that's where we're going to encounter one of the most dirty substances that we're going to find during this process, and that is corrugated cardboard. And so as we open up what this cardboard holds in terms of these sterile supplies, and we start to remove our supplies, pretty soon, even if you can't see them, we're going to be finding filamentous fungi. We've got bacteria. We've got yeast. We've got a lot of spore-forming bacilli that are crowded onto this cardboard. Why is that? Well, the process of how cardboard is made involves taking either recycled boxes or wood pulp, creating a, a, a pulp out of that, a slurry, and then drying it to make cardboard. And in that process, there's a lot of contamination that occurs. It comes in with the wood or comes in with cardboard, and only some of it is killed off during that process of making the cardboard. And so particularly, we end up with a lot of spore-forming bacteria, and we end up with a lot of fungi. Why fungi? Because it turns out fungi can actually use cellulose in the cardboard as a food source. So we're going to have high levels of contamination on the cardboard. We know we're not going to bring that into the clean room. But as we move sterile supplies like these IV bags, we're going to have to somehow disinfect the surface of these as we move them into classified spaces. So how do we go about doing that? Well, USP 797, the new chapter coming out in November, talks about an option of using a sporicidal disinfectant, a daily disinfectant, or IPA. And while IPA might seem like the simplest and, and best option, something readily available, normal IPA or any IPA is not going to kill bacterial spores and fungi, no matter how long you leave it wet on the surface. And so while maybe a daily disinfectant would be achieve some of those goals, you really need a sporicidal disinfectant. Leave it on for three minutes if it's paradox, and that will kill bacterial spores and fungal spores and all the other microorganisms that might be associated with that cardboard that's now transferred to my supplies. Interesting enough for our Canadian uh, visitors today, they know that NAPRA, which is kind of the USP version in Canada, um, that, that standard actually requires you to use a sporicidal disinfectant to wipe down these supplies. Again, USP gives the option, but when you look at what kind of contamination is on this cardboard and how high it might be, even on these kind of plastics that are coming into our, our clean room, we really recommend that you use a sporicidal disinfectant. So I hope that helps understand a little bit about why it's so critical to do this material transfer step and start off with a powerful disinfectant so we don't bring those microbes even into our, uh, our, our less controlled spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for helping us understand why Contact really suggests using that sporicidal disinfectant for wiping down items across the line of demarcation. Um, the chapter also has some specific requirements for placing items into our primary engineering control. So let's just start with taking a, a look at that language. It comes from section 8.2 uh, of the chapter, and it says just before any item is introduced to the primary engineering control, it must be wiped with sterile 70% IPA using sterile low lint wipers and allowed to dry before use. 
But there's also one more caveat in the language, and there, it gives a little bit of additional context. It says that when sterile items are received in sealed containers designed to keep them sterile until opening, these sterile items may be removed from the covering as the supplies are introduced into the class five PEC without the need to wipe individual sterile supplies with sterile 70% IPA. So essentially, just to recap, the chapter says coming into my PEC, it must be wiped with sterile 70% IPA. Coming into the clean room, I had the option of using sterile IPA, a registered disinfectant, or my sporicide. But inside of our PEC, our primary engineering control, it must be 70% sterile IPA. Unless your manufacturer has designed packaging that allows the, the inner package to remain sterile as it's introduced into the primary engineering control. And we'll go through a few of those exercises this morning. So our main goal with this webinar is to help you understand how, you know, with the new requirements around maintaining sterile products inside of our PEC, how do we get a product into our primary engineering control and, and maintain its cleanliness from contact? And then how are we going to maintain that cleanliness over the use of that product? So let's start with a bottle of sterile IPA. We're going to do both a pull cap, a flip top cap, as well as a trigger installation on our bottle of sterile alcohol. So I'm going to start, obviously, before I ever want to uh, come and remove anything from my primary engineering control, I'm going to spray my gloves with sterile isopropyl alcohol before I introduce that item. Now, I want us to sort of take a look at this packaging. It's, it's double bagged. Hopefully, you can sort of see that on the camera. But this is where it talked about, as the chapter said, if the packing is designed so that we can introduce a sterile item without the need to wipe it. So we wipe down the outside of this bag as it crossed our line of demarcation coming into our clean room. But it's this inside bag that we want to remain pristine. So with contact sterile alcohol, the actual outside bag kind of tears relatively easily. And then I can just sort of deposit that inside sterile packaging directly onto the surface of my engineering control. And then I will take this item, I will set it out to the side, it will be discarded in our trash. I'm now able to go, I'm going to take this bag and break it open. I want to keep this flip top lid that's in the packaging. I'm going to leave this sort of in this bag down here so that that lid will not touch the surface of my primary engineering control, but I'll be able to access it here in just a moment. So with our flip top alcohol, you'll remove this yellow lid that was on, on top of the bottle during the shipping process. And with our flip top sterile alcohol, Contech has provided this foil top lift tab that you're very easily sort of with your fingers able to go and sort of quickly remove that tab and place it to the side for disposal. I can now take my flip top lid and screw that on top of my bottle of alcohol. And it will be there for available for use inside of my clean room. This product I've now opened in ISO 5 conditions. We think as a best practice, you should open all of your alcohol bottles and all of your disinfectants in this ISO 5 air condition as a best practice to sort of maintain that cleanliness. And then now that I've opened the bottle and installed the flip top, or in just a moment, we'll install a trigger, I could take this bottle and use it somewhere else in my ante room or my buffer room. If I ever remove it from my primary engineering control, I want to insist that the flip top lid is properly sealed so i'm protecting the ingredients the, the alcohol that's in that bottle from an outside environment and i can remove it from my primary engineering control but before i could ever bring that back into the primary engineering control i want to take sort of a pre-saturated alcohol wipe that i could use to wipe down the outside of that bottle before reintroducing it into my pec So let's move on and talk about opening a trigger bottle of sterile IPA. So it's very similar. I want to gather, I'll gather my trash that I'd use from opening the pull top. I'll dispose of that. I'm going to re-wet my hands with sterile alcohol. Wipe them down thoroughly. Give them a chance to dry before I grab my next product and introduce it. 
Again, so this outside packaging, we wipe this packaging when we introduce the, the product across the line of demarcation into our clean room. And we're trying to protect the integrity of that inside package so that I can introduce it directly into my primary engineering control without that additional alcohol wipe down step. So I'm gonna sort of tear open that package and I'm gonna deposit that inner sterile package with the trigger onto the surface of my primary engineering control. Now I'm gonna open this inside bag. I wanna make sure that I leave the trigger inside of this bag so that it does not touch the deck of my primary engineering control. Place the bottle on the deck of my PEC and I'll remove this lid. Now, I generally like to, to spray my hands with alcohol one more time before I install that trigger, just as sort of an extra precautionary step, because you do sort of have to make contact with the top of that, that trigger straw in, it in order to get enough force to pierce down into the package. So I'm holding sort of from the top of the straw, woo, and of course that would happen live when we're on webinar, and I'm able to pierce through the foil. I will bring that down and screw the cap onto the top of the bottle. So this could be a bottle that I'm gonna be using inside of my non-hazardous primary engineering control. Obviously, if you're doing hazardous compounding, you're gonna to have to use that flip top enclosure. Or now that I've installed the trigger inside of my ISO 5 engineering controls, I could then remove this bottle out and use it in my ante room or my buffer room. So we've talked about opening both our flip top alcohol as well as our sterile alcohol, but I wanna talk about context disinfectants, both our sterile Paradox and our sterile TB1-3300. The new chapter requires that any disinfectants that I use in the primary engineering control be sterile. So we wanna have good aseptic technique and a good process and protocol as we get into the tops of these bottles. So we'll run through that. Again, before I place any item into my primary engineering control, I wanna make sure that I've wiped my hands with sterile alcohol. Now with our disinfectants, they still are double bagged, but it's a much thicker bag. It's a little bit difficult to tear that plastic, but these have linear tears. So at the bottom of this pouch, it's actually quite easy to sort of tear that pouch. And then you're able to quickly deposit that bottle directly onto the surface of your primary engineering control. The same thing at the bottom of this pouch, there's a linear tear that I'm able to tear this pouch open, but I wanna be careful as I'm depositing this uh, bottle onto the deck of the primary engineering control, not to let that bottle cap just spill out directly onto the surface of my PEC. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take the lid off and I wanna talk about this foil enclosure that's on the top of the Paradox bottle. This is to ensure obviously that there's no spillage during shipment, um, but the way that is induction sealed on there, we don't have that little pull tab like we do on the flip top bottle of alcohol. We've got our engineering team working on that. So hopefully in the future, we'll be able to have a very simple to use pull tab on top of that fo uh, foil bottle seal. But right now that foil bottle seal is difficult to, to get into. And so we wanted to come up with a way that you could help maintain sort of the cleanliness of this product, have good aseptic technique for entering it. One suggestion that I'm gonna give are these sterile lancets. These are available, they're, they're less than a nickel a piece. And these are used for sort of doing that, that finger prick. If they're gonna do a blood test. So I'm able to sort of tear this sterile lancet and remove this tool. I can then use it to sort of cut and make sure the camera can see, pierce that foil and almost draw an X on top of that foil packaging. And that's gonna help ensure that the liquid will go out. If you are gonna use something like this sterile lancet to pierce that, make sure you have a sharps container or something so that you may safely dispose of those items uh, and no one gets injured. So once I've done that, I can now go back in and get my sterile flip top cap and screw that on top of my bottle of Paradox. That allows me to flip the product open. I could use this for doing my sporocidal disinfection in my primary engineering control or hazardous drug decontamination in my CPEC. 
but you don't want to leave this product stored in your PEC all day long. You're going to use it for that initial cleaning step or your decontamination step. But as long as you've opened it in that ISO 5 condition, you want to make sure you securely flip that lid back down in ISO 5 conditions. And then you can remove that bottle for storage in your buffer room and bring it back into your PEC when it's needed. Make sure before you reintroduce anything into our primary engineering control that we are properly wiping it down with sterile isopropyl alcohol before we place it inside of our primary engineering control. So I'm going to gather up some of the trash from that last. I'm going to spray my hands with sterile alcohol. So we've talked about introducing items into our SEC. You know, we're getting them from our loading dock up to the clean room. Best practice using that cardboard tote. We talked about bringing items across our line of demarcation into our clean room. Why using a sporicide is best practice. And we've gone through our three most popular contact products, our sterile alcohol and flip top and trigger format, as well as our paradox sporicidal disinfection on how we want to introduce those items into our PEC. Again, because of the way that is double packaged, we can sort of open that outer bag and present that product into our PEC. But the last section of Section 8 with material handling has to do with critical site wipes. And there is some language that says critical site wipes, ampule necks, and intravenous bag septums must be wiped with sterile 70% IPA in the PEC to provide chemical and mechanical actions to remove contaminants. So we've got a, a pack of our crit critical site wipes here. You know, oftentimes I've seen the individual alcohol prep pads used. Those wipes, those prep pads were designed for, for skin asepsis. Before I get a shot, they're gonna wipe my arm. The material, the fabric that's in those wipes is just not appropriate for an ISO 5 environment. So you wanna make sure that the product you're using, A, it must be sterile because of the new chapter requirements, but also it must be low lens. So the fabric, the substrate itself, must be appropriate to use in a clean room environment. So with these critical site wipes, I'm going to peel and seal the pouch open. I'm going to pull out one wipe. You know, when you're closing any pre-saturated pack, you want to make sure you're not leaving any air in the pouch and that you fully seal that down on all corners. So once I've got my critical site wipe out, I'm going to fold it. And best practice is I'm going to take three strokes, three wipes away from myself. So I'm going to go one, two, and three. So critical site wiping is a critical aspect of the new chapter. You just want to make sure that the fabric and the substrate that you're using is going to be appropriate for an ISO 5 environment. And the last sort of uh, comment or warning I want to give you is the new chapter is very specific about having no exposed skin in your primary engineering control. Most of us are going to be compounded the way I'm dressed right now. Of course, you're going to have a mask on. I'm not wearing a mask, so hopefully you could, could hear me talk but you're gonna be wearing your bouffant, mostly a clean room IV grant gown. You'll have on your sterile gloves, but you need to make sure because my face will have exposed skin that I'm not sort of leaning deeply into that primary engineering control, breaking the plane and allowing to have any of my exposed skin in my primary engineering control. So thank you for walking through those steps with me of getting our product from the loading dock into the clean room itself and finally, into our primary engineering control. You know, we've talked about maintaining the cleanliness, of the cleanliness of this, but obviously one of the chapters that we're asked constantly now is how long are products sterile after opening? So I'm gonna throw it over to our senior product manager, Kadar Patel, and he's gonna talk about sterility of these products after opening. Hey, thanks, Michael. So just like you mentioned, it asks the question in 7.1.2, if we can pull that up, we'll read it. Once open, sterile cleaning and disinfecting agents and supplies like the, the closed containers of sterile wipes and sterile 70% IPA may be reused for a time period specified as by the manufacturer, us, and or described in the facility written SOPs, you. So basically, what do we need to answer here? The sterility of a product is broken once that seal is broken. So we just looked at uh, Michael introducing a lot of products into the PEC, but hopefully you, you watched and took notes on how he maintained the hygiene of the product. And that's really what we were trying to talk about now. 
the hygiene of the product is dependent on not only our aseptic techniques, but the environments that we actually have them in. So we're trying not to introduce additional bio burden. Okay, so when the product comes in, it is sterile. It's validated sterile. And I would encourage you, if you're looking at any other manufacturer, to ask for that documentation because just having a product irradiated versus validated sterile is a big difference. Uh, so now what we're trying to do is just maintain the integrity of the product using our aseptic techniques, closing all the products in the ISO 5 before we remove it, wiping down, reintroducing, opening it back in the ISO 5. Now to help with this, Dr. Mark Weinsick and his team have helped with a new document that will be coming out within the next week or two on, on how long a product is good for. And again, this is going to be all determined on your aseptic technique, your SOPs, but once you write it in, you're going to have to follow it. So this is general guidance. You need to use all your data points, your environmental monitoring, your fingertip sampling, all those type of tools that we have to help you. We also have a lot of resources, including other webinars to help. And here to talk about it is Rachel Hansen, our marketing manager with Contact Healthcare. Hi everyone. At Contact Healthcare, we like to say that our people are our greatest resources. And that's why I'm here with Scott and Kevin, who will be answering your product specific questions right after the webinar. But first, I wanted to point out two resources that we already have written and created by our experts that are available to you now via the links posted in the chat. First, a webinar library, just like Kadar mentioned, where you are able to view this webinar and all of our past webinars and access materials that have been mentioned. And secondly, a dedicated section on our website for all things USP 797, 800, and 825. We hope you will find these resources helpful and let us know how else we can support you. And with that, it's back to Michael and Kedar for some Q&A. All right, thank you everyone. So we had a lot of questions submitted as people registered and then we've had questions coming in. So we've got uh, about 10 or a little more minutes that we're gonna try to get to as many of these questions as we can. But before I do that, I've got to give a huge shout out to Context Video Department, who has helped us produce this webinar, webinar today from Studio 289. I want to give a shout out to all the folks in our control room. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Chris. We've got Ryan on cameras. We transferred, I don't know if you guys noticed, we transferred this set over. We started as an ante room. And before we end, and we've got our, our experts over on the other side of the set. So I want to thank our crew for making us look looks so great. And with that, let's jump into some of the questions. So let's go, we'll start with some of the pre-submitted questions. And I think I will take this first one. They asked, can you use a germicidal canister wipe on a daily basis to wipe down all incoming materials to the sterile compounding clean room? Well, yes, you can. So as we talked about, the chapter allows you to either use sterile isopropyl alcohol, you're going to use your sterile uh, EPA or EPA registered disinfectant or sporicidal disinfectant. We believe, and as Dr. Mines, Dr. Weinsick explained earlier, that using that sporicide to help eliminate any of that risk from corrugated cardboard would be your best practice um, for that scenario. Kater, why don't you take this one? Well, they wanted to ask about some of the mitigation strategies when using sporicides that have strong or offensive odors. Oh, that's, I mean, that's a good one. Uh, a lot of our contact healthcare sales representatives can come in and actually show you some of these mitigation strategies, but less is more when you have a fast contact time of a sporicidal in three minutes. So less is always more. Uh, I know that you used some of the containment techniques earlier, Michael, with the zip locking feature bags, uh, once they're spent wipers, all these things can make a huge difference when it comes to the experience of an employee. It's a great question, but I would encourage you to contact your local contact healthcare sales representative and let them come in and show you some of these techniques. And I think just sort of the obvious hanger in that question, sporicides are always going to have an odor. If you're going to kill spores, it's either going to be a, probably a strong bleach smell or, or a vinegar smell and bleach. You know, we're all sort of familiar with, with the, the downsides of a bleach product. So Kedar, while we've got your smiling face on camera, next question, is preempt available sterile? Unfortunately, that chemistry of being 0.5% hydrogen peroxide is not available sterile. Uh, it can't be filled with the aseptic technique. But the good thing is we do have the TB1 that is available sterile. Uh, so I do want to actually mention something too. Knowing that we're going to have to go sterile in the primary engineering controls in the ISO 5 space, we really need to understand 
what our non-sterile products are going to transition to sterile. We want to go ahead and start procuring those types of products because sterile capacity can be an issue if we wait to the last minute. So while we have time, let's go ahead and build that stock because we know we're going to need this. So I would encourage you to work again with your contact healthcare sales representative just to see what non-sterile products you're using within the primary engineering control. That way we can help you plan for the sterile aspects of those. Yeah, the, the countdown is on. November 1st is going to be here. We're just going to blink and November the 1st will be here. So get your sort of get your planning in, in motion now. We've got a, a, a bunch of them coming in now, Kadar. Mm -hmm. Is Paradox hazardous to humans in the environment? And if so, why, what is the exposure risk to Paradox and how long should uh, prolonged exposure be endured? Well, this is, this is another uh, great question, but I'm going to kind of correct it a little bit. Paradox is not necessarily hazardous if we use it correctly. What we're trying to do with Paradox is reduce the hazards associated with working in these environments, whether it be microbial growth or with even a decon agent when we're working in USPA 100 type materials. So I do want to kind of correct that a little bit. But there, again, when it comes to the best practices and the mitigation strategies, we're able to help. So the contact healthcare sales representative can come in and actually show how to use these products. And we also have documentations that Rachel Hansen mentioned as far as minimizing exposure to this. You can actually study these and then make the right recommendations for any type of personal protective equipment that you may have in the facility. Definitely. So I had this question come in about gloves. They wanted to just confirm, do you have to wear gloves to perform material transfer into the IV room? And do the gloves need to be sterile? Yes, you have to wear gloves. The chapter requires that the person wiping down be wearing gloves. And that's really because, you know, prolonged exposure to cleaning agents, just constant exposure to those agents can irritate your skin after time. So, but the gloves do not have to be sterile. You know, obviously when you're working in the buffer room, compounding medication, sterile glove and, you know, properly donning those. But for just that, that cleaning step of transferring, maybe even just into your pass through as well, you're standing outside in a general clean, a pharmacy area, mm -hmm. but you still need to be wearing gloves as you're wiping those items down to place into a pass through or certainly in your, on the dirty side of your uh, line of demarcation, putting them into the, into the clean room. And I, I would add one more thing to that too, Michael, those gloves could be potentially different, right? You might have more of a chemical resistant glove in some instances where you need the sterility and the dexterity working with your, your pharmaceuticals. So it's important to make sure that you're matching it up correctly. All right. Do you have to decarton boxes prior to bringing into the buffer room? Why, if no, what is the best recommendation to perform material transfer on, on cartoned items? So we talked about it sort of with ourselves, you know, with contact products, they arrive in those corrugated boxes. You want to make sure, you know, that you're transferring them into some sort of plastic tote before you bring them up there. Um, you're going to do this, you know, definitely in your prep areas before that they make it into your ante room. Um, there are some packages um, that are made for clean rooms uh, that are put in, in uh, plastic boxes almost that are not corrugated cardboard. Those you could bring into your clean room, but you want to make sure that you wipe those down. A lot of those especially might be hazardous mm -hmm. uh, materials, has HD for HD compounding. Those you definitely want to leave that and, and reduce any chance of exposure um, as you bring those boxes in. So let me move on down the list. All right. This one asked, what is the correct definition of contact time? Apologies if this sounds obvious, but there's no consensus out there if contact time means two minutes from the first spray or if the surface needs to be continuously wetted, resprayed with a sanitizing agent for the full two minutes or contact time. It needs to, the surface needs to remain wet for what that contact time is. So with our Paradox RTU, that's a three-minute contact or dwell time. So the, 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 the spraying of this is kind of the impact on when, and A, you would never spray Paradox. So as you, you know, any sporocidal agent, you're going to pour onto a wiper and apply onto the surface. But the minute you see the wetness on that surface is when the clock begins. So with Paradox, it's three minutes. With our TV1 3300, that's a one-minute product. If you are using preempt outside the PEC in the general clean room itself, that's a, the preempt plus is a one minute. And that's something an inspector is going to ask. If they come in and they see a, a, one of your employees using a bottle of a chemistry, I guarantee the inspector is going to go up and ask that employee, what's the contact time for that agent that you're using? And they'll need to know that. So make sure that's a, a deep part of your training that people understand 
contact times what they are mm -hmm. and how to achieve them, making sure that surface truly stays wet for that time. All right, let's move on down the list. Okay, Dar. How to mitigate oxidation in stains caused by TB13300 and Paradox. Ooh, this is, this is another good one because of the heightened need for different types of chemistries, Michael. Uh, we may see legacy uh, primary engineering controls have physical damage or even chemistry damage from drugs that were compounding that is now being heightened and um, made aware when using these different types of chemistries. I'm not saying TB1, 3300, or Paradox contribute to it, but the reality is we've done some webinars on this to talk about not only that type of damage that's already been there, but the chemical composition of the stainless steel and the material <coughs> types uh, that may be influencing the, the rouging and the different types of brown spotting that we may see within there. So uh, I would encourage you to use some of those resources as well that we have out there. Our healthcare sales representatives can actually send that to you so that you can review that uh, and seriously uh, look into our LinkedIn and our website post because we talk on a lot of these different topics regularly. So that's a great webinar. Rachel Davidson here at Contact gets deep into the types of stainless and you know, sourcing the right stainless and then there's, de there's definitely different types of corrosion, sort of the source of it, and then how do you deal with it? And there's so a that, spelling test at the end with all those elements. I, I did not do that <laughs> on, on that spelling test. All right, so I'm going to take this next question. Someone asked about, with our critical site wipes, can you wipe as many critical sites as possible That's as long true. as the wipe is wet? Mm -hmm. um, so this is an interesting question. The chapter, the, the revised chapter does not specifically address how many critical sites. When we talk and with our friends in the industry and industry experts, they tell us that you can wipe as many vials as you can with that one critical site wipe as long as it's wet mm -hmm. and it's effectively sort of cleaning the top of that vial. Some of the confusion came from back in the 2008 chapter, there was some language and it said the surface of the sterile 70% IPA swabs used for disinfecting entry points of sterile packages and devices shall not contact any object before contact the surface of the entry point. Mm -hmm. So in the past, when joint commission or one of the state boards would come in and would talk with pharmacists about that, they were looking at this language in the original chapter mm -hmm. talking about that. That language was removed from the new chapter, I think because this sentence caused some confusion with some of those, those inspectors. So our answer there is that yes, you can wipe as many of those entry points as you can, as long as it's wet and you're you know, physically seeing the, the wetness of that IPA on top of that entry point. And it's really critical that you let that alcohol, that IPA dry before you puncture the needle through. So it's the three wipes with a critical site wipe and then make sure it sits there long mm -hmm. enough to fully flash off that IPA before you puncture through with your needle. And uh, you did mention earlier, Michael, kind of that little uh, sepsis type of, of wipe oh, to prep okay. your, your skin. We actually also have a paper on why that might need, not be the most sufficient way of, of doing this. So again, back to the resources, we're changing. We understand that the standards are elevating some of our practices, but we're changing with you. So we're trying to help with the information that you can make an informed decision when it comes to the products as well. Hey, Kedar, this one would be good for you. All right. Do we have to keep sterile products in the hood once they're open? Well, I mean, that's going to be based on the SOP, but I think, Michael, you showed that there's some opportunities to save some storage space, depending on the frequency of use. I would try to encourage you to look at your consumable usage as well, because if you can match that up with maybe a daily occurrence or maybe every two days, you're going to be able to turn that sterile product a little bit more regularly, depending on the put-ups that you may consider. So again, the, the, I sound like a broken record, but we are truly a resource here. We understand there's budget considerations. We understand there's space considerations. So we really want to try to help you with the right product choice to, to mitigate any of those type of challenges. Excellent. We've got some minutes here. So let's just blast through as many of these questions as we can. Sure. Jadar, um, this person wants to clarify cleaning product rotation. So rotation of disinfectants that that's not, doesn't really apply to their word was hospital clean rooms. Well, uh, there is a rotation need. OK, but the way it was defined in the past was within the daily type of disinfectants. And, and that's just not the case anymore. Before, there might have been different pH levels that killed different types of bacteria and viruses. But now there's broad spectrum. It can actually kill a lot of the same organisms with just one solution. The rotation is actually between what you mentioned earlier, and that's your sporicidal product that you want to use on a le uh, least frequent basis versus your daily disinfectant. 
depending on what category you're compounding. So there is a need for rotation. It's just redefined uh, and the industry just needs to understand it's between your daily and your sporocidal activity. Yeah, that's how we define it. And that's your frequency is going to be defined by your cat compound. So if you're doing category one and two, you've got to do that spore side at least monthly. If you're doing category three, it must be at least weekly, along with all the other sort of category three, right. category three stuff. All right, let us move on. Kedar, we just answered that one. So this next one will be for me. Um, he would like some insight on the controversial opinions of cleaning the HEPA filter covers in the LAFW BSC, yes, no, or periodically. I did not realize that was a controversial opinion. I don't know, can the, Daniel, is the camera in the PEC still on? This is on, this is on the fly. I'm asking Daniel to cut it. So you're not really able to see it from this angle, but th this back wall, this screen, I do need to clean this on a daily basis. What I don't want to do is spray or pour any chemistry directly at that screen because it could damage the HEPA filter that's behind it. But I certainly want to do either using my easy reach tool, because again, I don't want to break the plane with my face. So sometimes it's hard to reach sort of that back screen. So that's where one of our easy reach tools might come into play. But that back screen definitely needs to be cleaned. Wipe your wipe or wipe your applicator before you go by. And that needs to be a definite part of, of your daily screening. But just make sure you never like with a trigger alcohol bottle, you never spray it directly at that screen because then you actually could do some some damage to your HEPA filter. Oh, sorry, Mike. I was just changing all the questions <laughs> for you to answer. All the stuff sorry. <laughs> And uh, this next one is going to be for me too. Products such as tubing sets for automated combat package and single fully plastic paper-like material bag, can't these be peeled in place from the edge of the PEC, meaning it won't require an additional wipe down once the items introduce the ISO 7 buffer area? Yeah, that's a great question. That's what we talked about. And we showed that additional language from Section 8 that talked about if the manufacturer provides materials in a way that you can sort of peel and present. And I showed you a way you could do that with our alcohol or our disinfectant bottles, but also a lot of times syringes or these other package, they'll be, they'll be provided to you in that sort of presentation, sterile packaging that you're able to sort of present it across that plane and deposit it into your ISO 5 environment without that additional need for that wipe down step. All right, so we do have, we've got a couple more minutes. So we had a couple of questions that came in that really aren't in our expert world of expertise, but I did reach out to one of our industry friends and wanted to sort of get their opinion on that. So um, this came down to, uh, again, bring in items and non-corrugated cardboard. So this would sort of be like the, those plastic style boxes. These need to be wiped down in the IV room, or do they need to be open in each file wiped down individually? So I talked with a few of our expert friends and they basically agreed their biggest concern was around hazardous drugs, that, that those are the packages that you do not want to open and try to handle those individual components. You imagine a small box with six files. If one of those was damaged in shipment, all the five remaining of those files are going to be contaminated. So those boxes you want to get sealed. But other than that, they do recommend that it's best remove products from their boxes, wiping down individually as patient preps or batches are pulled and staged for entry into the clean room. If you're talking about source containers for PN, then it's best to stock a cart with fast movers and stock enough for two to three days as such each vial would be wiped. If the scenario does not include these, then please keep in mind the buffer room is not a storage area and whatever is brought in should be kept in momentum. You know, anything that's brought and stored in that buffer room is gonna be, you're gonna have to clean it during, mm -hmm. that, during that, that monthly cleaning. All right, so let's see. There was one more that I had reached out. I thought this one was a pretty good one. They asked, do trash bags need to be wiped before they're put in containers? We change our buffer room trash bags by dragging them into the ante room first. You know, they're full bags as they're removing them, but we're not wiping the actual bags down. So you know you really don't need to wipe the trash bag down. They're going to be stored on a roll sort of inside of themselves. Um, but really, if you've got large trash cans, it's best practice to have those on casters so that you can sort of roll that into the room without dragging uh, stuff across the floor. You know, anything that's down on the floor is going to be obviously considered dirty and you don't want to sort of transfer the, the dirtiest part of that room in, mm -hmm. into another room like that. Let us scroll down. 
All right, we did have some new questions and we've got about two minutes. So let me look over these real quick. How long is sterile open? You answer that. Can we throw Paradox in the regular trash? Why or why not? Kedar, do you want to answer that one? Well, it depends on what you're actually cleaning or what the task is as well. Once it's a spent wiper, you can. But if it's picking up like for a decon agent, then we'd encourage you to go down the proper waste stream that way. They ask closed caption versus will be made available on demand. We absolutely will make that on demand. And there are, it looks like there are about ooh, a lot of questions <laughs> came in. So we're going to have to do some follow up after the webinar. If you ask a question, be assured uh, that we're going to get back to you with that answer. I want to thank you sort of for our portion of walking through this here today. And we're going to be throwing it back to Rachel, uh, Scott Harward and Kevin Benicia for a wrap and talking about some pro all these products that we've used today, they're going to be answer, answer the specific product questions that came in, as well as uh, uh, address how you may have someone come to your facility and do some technical training with your staff. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Hey, everyone. I'm Rachel Hanson, the Marketing Manager for Contact Healthcare, and I'm here with Scott Harward and Kevin Minetzia. Gentlemen, would you like to tell us a little bit about what you do at Contact Healthcare? Yeah, so I'm the regional business, business manager for North America East, basically everything from the Mississippi River uh, East, uh, also Minnesota, a little bit of Texas and Louisiana, and I've got a team of nine reps uh, spread out throughout the country, and I've been with Contact for about 10 years. And I'm a, a regional business manager for the West Coast, uh, North America, and I have a team of eight people, and uh, we're out there to help assist our, our customers with uh, all your needs when it comes to cleaning, disinfecting, and garbing. All right, thanks guys. So welcome to Dwell Time, our post-webinar show where we get into the nitty-gritty nitty -gritty details of all the things presented during our webinar. So um, first, we are going to answer some product-specific questions that uh, came up in uh, Michael's webinar. And I'm going to go over to Kevin and ask you to talk a little bit about critical site wipes. Yeah, so Michael and uh, Kadar touched on critical site wipes quite a bit. Um, they're a great product for wiping your vial stoppers, your ampule necks. Um, and the difference between those and the commonly used product that you see out there, which is a one and a half by one and a half inch wipe, is you, you have to continually, continually, continuously open those. And there's a lot of trash to discard. Whereas this here comes nice prepackaged, 50 wipes per package, and it's easy to open, close, and uh, cover more vials per, uh, per wipe. So great product for that application. And Michael, I think Michael or Kadar mentioned something about, you know, critical site wipes versus alcohol or sterile alcohol pads. So what's your take on all that? Well, sterile alcohol pads, the little one by one and a half by one and a half inch uh, wipes, those are, you know, could or could not be low linting. Uh, depends on what you're getting. And they're really uh, designed for wiping down a patient's skin before injection. So again, uh, not really maybe the right uh, application for that uh, product. So again, we designed this product specific for this application that we're uh, dealing with with critical sites. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, before we move on to your take on sterile alcohol, Scott, um, we did want to just mention that uh, you are free to leave if you need it to. Um, our webinar is officially over, but we of course want you to stick around uh, with us through dwell time. Um, but just wanted to mention that if you would like to um, exit now, you absolutely can. And we will follow up with all of the questions that have come in. Um, and we will have the recording of this webinar available to you as well. So um, with that, Scott, mm -hmm. so um, critical site wipes, they are pre-saturated with sterile alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, what makes ours unique? So for those that think that all sterile alcohol is, is created equal. Um, I have a little bit of a, a, a problem with, because it all, it, it all goes back to where is that product produced, sure. right? Where is it made? And with that, we have the complete traceability and control over that process. So every single uh, bottle um, that's uh, used in the States and in, and in Canada uh, is, is assembled here um, and uh, packaged appropriately. And then it goes off to a radiation. So, uh, traceability and control of the process is extremely important. And each lot is going to come with its own certificate of sterility as well. So, you know, if you ask that for some other products that are maybe uh, uh, produced or made overseas, you might not get that level of detail. 
I gotcha. That's great. Great information. All right. So with USP 797 new standards, what are some of the biggest changes in um, cleaning and disinfecting? Mm -hmm. Well, if you've seen any of our, our past webinars or, or uh, listen to what Michael said earlier, uh, the biggest change is sterile okay. versus non-sterile, right? So the, the requirement, uh, the, the verbiage must inside the ISO 5 PEC, CPEC, and then should in the ISO 7 and 8 environments. So I think that's the biggest change. Yeah. And Kevin, what's your take on maybe products for um, these changes that Scott mentioned? Yeah. So one of the commonly used products that, that's been used in the uh, PEC for a long time is our preempt or preempt plus. Again, that was mentioned. That's not going to be able to be sterilized anymore. So TB1-3300 is our new uh, daily germicidal disinfectant. comes sterile and it is a one minute dwell time across all microorganisms. So it's a great product, fast acting and a, gr a lot of kill power. That's great. And then, and then, and then for your uh, weekly sporocidal, you have Sterile Paradox. And I think everybody's pretty familiar with that product. And it's a three-minute dwell time. Uh, so great for your best practice weekly cleaning within your PEC. And then also for decontaminating your CPECs. Gotcha. So that's our one-two punch for uh, our daily and uh, weekly sporocidals. One-two punch. I like it. Um, all right. So moving on to some of the questions that came in. Here's a question for you, Scott. Um, what disinfectants are available in sterile packaging other than Paradox? Well, Kevin just mentioned uh, a couple of those. So TB1 is, is available sterile and non-sterile. And Kevin actually has a nice <laughs> bag of that. So um, each bottle will have a silver border. This is actually the non-sterile version. Thank you, Kevin, for setting me up with that. <laughs> uh, but each, each bottle will have a silver border yeah. and it's our intent to continue to update and try to differentiate these products as we move forward. Um, also, uh, sterile easy reach pads. I know a lot of people use, uh, use those in your, in your ISO 5, uh, whether it be your, your regular laminar airflow for those that are vertically challenged, um, but also for your biological safety cabinets, which are, are difficult to clean and you wanna protect your workers from those environments. Also critical sites, uh, you know, Kevin talked about that as well. And um, basically anything you would need sterile for those environments, we've got available. So sterile alcohol, of course, uh, whether it be in the bottle or pre-saturated wipes as well. Um, so I can't think that's a, a general rundown yeah. of the sterile products that we have available. That's great. Um, and kind of similar question, Kevin, when will st sterile products for <clears throat> wiping be available as preset wipes in a package? Um, so sterile TB1-3300, we actually have a peel and reseal available now. Um, make sure you provide us with your, your usage. That's very important. Kadar talked about forecasting, and that's essential when it comes to sterile products. But this is available sterile, has the sterile uh, outline border here. Um, I know the big question that always comes up, uh, do you have sterile paradox wipes? Um, at this time, uh, unfortunately, we do not. Um, and that's something, uh, you know, we're going to work on. <laughs> We're working on it. It's very <laughs> difficult to, to, to do, but uh, we're working on it and hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll have something down the road. That's hilarious. All right. Well, final question, Scott and Kevin. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your teams and how they can provide side-by-side -side support to our viewers? Absolutely. So I've got a team of nine. Kevin has a team of, of eight. So regionally located throughout the country to work side-by-side uh, -side with our distribution uh, partners. Uh, we've got uh, six of those across the country as well. Uh, they're an extension of us, and uh, we work with our customers. So we think this of this as more of a partnership than you buying different products from different vendors, right? Uh, when you work with Contact, you know that you're going to be taken care of, and uh, we're going to co-author the right solution based on your environment, your workflow, and um, and uh, your team. So that's awesome. And Kevin, what about you? Yeah, pretty much what Scott said there. You know, we have a lot of value-added resources available to you uh, to, to offer um, a lot of those documents that Kadar talked about earlier, our technical bulletins, um, you know, our webinars like this, um, our uh, USP experience on our website is a great resource to go to. Um, but then as far as the team's concerned, um, you know, they're out there working day in, day out uh, to help our customers in, in bringing them the best possible solutions. Absolutely. And I know y'all's team members and they're absolutely awesome. So thank you again for joining us for our first dwell time. If you have more questions, we're always ready to help and you can learn a lot more and even request a visit from one of Scott or Kevin's folks on our website, contacthealthcare.com. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.
a full head.